Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for letting us be together. And thank you, Lord, for this great meeting of Baptist friends. I remember, Lord, when you put it on preacher's heart. And I'm so glad you've, you've done that. And we give you all the glory. We pray for revival. And we pray for evangelism all across our country, this great state of Tennessee, and Lord, every state that is in America. Lord, may our country turn to you. Right this moment, Lord, I want to apologize to you for all the sin of our country. I am sorry. I am trying my best to repent right now for my sin and for the sin of our country. I know you hate sin. All of us in this room, we know that. You hate sin in my life, and you hate sin in a church, and you hate sin in a country. Please, Lord, forgive us. And send a mighty revival. Lord, it's happened before here in America. We're praying. And some of us have been fasting, Lord, that you would send revival. Please do a mighty work. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Wouldn't you love to see revival? I would. Let me show you a couple of videos, and then we'll give um, uh, Dr. Reynolds a moment to give a word of testimony. We've only got two videos. I was going to show you three. The one that you were in, Dr. Reynolds, um, the Internet here will block it. So you're going to give your personal testimony. <laughs> this first one is six minutes long, and the other video is about one minute long. We did this God Bless America rally in Charleston, West Virginia. There's 9,000 people turned out for it. 45 independent Baptist churches work together. You're going to hear a little bit uh, of the program from that night. It was two hours and 20 minutes long. This is a six-minute snapshot of it. Uh, you'll first hear the chaplain of the uh, West Virginia State Police. He's a steadfast Baptist man, and um, his name is Jimmy Mitchell. In fact, the coal miner's um, a funeral there in West Virginia that, that the president went to and the vice president, Joe Biden, Jimmy Mitchell was the preacher at it. So I do know that our president has heard the gospel himself because Jimmy Mitchell preached the gospel right there that day. He did a great job. Well, here it is, September the 11th, 45 independent Baptist churches working together. David Wood was the evangelist that night. We'll hear a little bit of his message. And a 612-voice choir. Now, that's my size choir. As a music publisher, that's my size, man. Anytime somebody calls and says, hey, send me 612 copies of anything. I'm happy. <laughs> Let's play a little bit of this, Brother Mark, if we could. The God Bless America rally, Charleston, West Virginia, last September. Amen. That's right. Amen. And next is a little touch of the choir on the song Turn the Tide. Amen.
then here comes Dr. David Wood who preached the gospel that night. That's right. Now listen. That's right, man. Here's the finale. Amen. Amen. Glory. And yes, we did shoot off confetti cannons at that point. <laughs> All right, we've got one more little video this was six minutes 20 minutes long six minutes and 20 seconds long everybody got uh, the, the sheet we'll, we'll get a sheet to you sir in fact here's one right here oh very good uh this next one uh yes this one here uh brother fowler thank you so much for helping us with this we'll show it in just a moment this is the workers for the one we did in um in uh hampton virginia that dr reynolds came and preached in this is just the workers we had six hundred workers and uh, you'll see them here and uh, this was just a, a I'll tell you God touched the workers meeting it was revival that night you'll see a little bit of Raymond Hancock preaching uh, Raymond Hancock's 80 some years old he jumped twice as he, that night as he preached God touched the service and I'll tell you all 40 churches that were involved in this meeting 
had a touch of revival. In fact, one of the churches that was in this meeting last week had 24 people walk the aisle to uh, make public professions of being saved. And when was the last time you had 24 folks walk down? When your church runs 300 and have 24 walk the aisle, they just made public profession of being saved. Praise God. Now, I know that revival and evangelism are not the same thing. I'll say that again. I know that revival and evangelism are not the same thing, but I'll tell you something. I've learned they're very compatible. <laughs> they work together very well. Well, here's a one-minute clip of that night. Let's listen, then we'll get into our notes, and we'll have a uh, testimony from Dr. Reynolds. Here we go. Thank you, Brother Mark. It says go, doesn't it? Amen. We bought that domain, GodBlessAmericaCrusade.com. Next month, next month, May 24th and 25th, I'm meeting again with preachers in the Charlotte, North Carolina area and preachers in the James Madison University area in Virginia, Harrisonburg, Virginia. And uh, we're praying and seeking God about having crusades there. Would you take your sheet? Let's, walk, let's walk, work through a little of this and uh, how to do it. You know, right here at this meeting Baptist Friends the first year the very first year of Baptist Friends on the Friday night of the meeting God had been dealing with me you know we, that year we'd handed out little white cards for all of us to put down on it places where God had spoke to our hearts about and so forth and I put down on mine Hampton Virginia because this year makes 40 years 40 years ago Twelve independent Baptist churches worked together in Hampton, Virginia to try to preach the gospel to everybody in my area. I was an eight-year-old boy. I had never been to church in my life. In fact, our family was mad at God. We felt God had failed us. It wasn't God who failed us. It was people who had failed us, and we had failed God. Well, they got me to the meeting. My uncle got right in the meeting. My uncle Burke came by the house, and he said, you got to come. My dad says, no way am I going to go to that. Finally, my uncle said, well, let the young'un come, country folk, young'un. That means young one. Let, let the young'un come. Now, I was the young'un. I wasn't the little'un because I've always been a big'un. <laughs> let the young'un come. I got for the first time in my life to hear preaching at a crusade. And an uh, uh, independent fundamental preacher was preaching. And uh, the first night of that crusade that I was at, it was the Wednesday night meeting, May 17th, 1972. It was the first time I ever heard preaching in my life. The preacher got up there and preached one hour on hell. He scared me to death. And I'll tell you something, the only reliable source of information about hell is the Bible. Amen. I mean, no one who says, I want to go to hell, they don't mean it or else they don't know what hell is like. Well, I said to one of my relatives, I said, I'm going to go forward and get saved. She said, you better not do that. I went home that night scared to death that I'd die in my sleep and go to hell because I knew I deserved it. By the grace of God, I got to go back to the crusade the next night. A little lost boy, a little thief, a little boy being used by a gang of people, to be honest with you. I knew things at age eight-year-old that no eight-year-old ought to ever know. <laughs> I got back to the meeting. Preacher got up that night and preached one hour on the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. I learned why Jesus died on the cross. He wasn't dying for his sin. He was dying for my sin. Man, at invitation, I just took off. And I got saved that night. And I'll tell you, things have not been the same in my life, or, nor in my family. Through the years, I can just tell you, many of them have been checked off being born again. Amen to that. Amen. 
it was a citywide crusade that I got saved in. And so here 40 years later, I believe God had called me, spoke to my heart about trying to have some of these crusades. You saw a little bit of the, the one in Charleston, West Virginia that I had an opportunity to be part of and so forth. And this one in February, this past February that we did in Hampton, Virginia. Dr. Reynolds helped us. Uh, Dr. Clarence Sexton helped us. Uh, numbers of folks helped. Forty independent Baptist churches working together. Now in our area we have 1.2 million people and 6,000 of them come to our churches. Do the math. That's like 100% of them don't go to our churches. Well, we're trying to do something about that. <laughs> and uh, I've never seen people work so hard uh, of uh, going soul winning. I mean, I'll tell you something this, this has done. People who have not done one thing in years got involved. People who haven't handed out a track in years were putting up posters, giving out flyers. Some were praying. Some were fasting. It was amazing what God did. Well, when, when, when I, two years ago, when I got on the altar and I said, Lord, I'll accept this. And this is what I prayed that night. I said, but Lord, you're going to have to educate me on how to do this. I couldn't find a Billy Graham handbook. I couldn't find a Jack Van Impey handbook. I couldn't find a Joe Boyd handbook. I couldn't find a John R. Rice handbook. I couldn't find any handbooks as far as how to put it together, all the details. And so what did I do? I started begging friends to help me figure out how to do this. <laughs> <coughs> So here's what we've got to show you today. We've got an 18-page playbook, as it were. Here's a little synopsis of four pages out of the 18 pages we put together. What is the purpose of this meeting? You know, you need to have a clearly defined purpose. This is one great big long sentence, basically, or, or two sentences. The purpose of the God Bless America Crusades. What is the purpose? The purpose of the God Bless America Crusades is to touch America with the gospel of Jesus Christ by reaching into the large cities. When the Lord explained the Great Commission, the first place to witness was to be a large, world-class city, Jerusalem. Well, millions of Americans have never heard the gospel. That's true. That's true. We are on the American mission field. So this is missionary work. Matthew 9, 35, the Bible says, And Jesus went about all the cities. Now that's the purpose, all right? Here's the leadership mission statement. For all the pastors, the 40 and 45 and uh, preachers of the two different groups, what's the mission statement? Well, here it is. For the glory of Almighty God, we will give, pray, and work together to host a multi-day evangelistic meeting with the goal of motivating, equipping, and training our church members to impact our area in the power of the Holy Ghost with, this, uh, with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now let's look at those key words. The first key word, we. The 40-some preachers, we. The pastors of the sponsored churches, we realize that everything rises and falls on leadership. You ever heard that? Is it true? Yes, it's true. And so this crusade will be no stronger than the dedication and effort of all the pastors. The GBA crusade is a cooperative effort of independent Baptist churches. Now, you saw that, that crowd of 9,000 there in the, the Coliseum on that first video. You saw 9,000. You mean, you mean, Brother Fox, everybody's sitting there as an independent Baptist? Oh, no. The Greek Orthodox were there. The Greek Orthodox priest called and said, may we come? We said, yes. We want them to come. Were, they, were, were some of the Greek Orthodox um, uh, decision counselors? No. <laughs> yeah. The Methodist called and said, may we sing in the choir? We said, you can come. <laughs> you know, this is an independent Baptist group. Everybody who's in this is independent Baptist. As far as all the workers, all the pastors, all that stuff, we, we the pastors, um, all independent Baptists. All right, now the next key word is together, together. We are independent, but we're not isolated. Well, of course we understand that we ought to be independent. I don't have any authority to tell you what to do at your church. I'm an evangelist, by the way. I'm not a pastor. If I were a pastor of my church, I would not have authority to tell you what to do in your church as far as my preferences and things like that. I, I can't do that. So I, I'm independent, but I'm not isolated. I can work with my friends who agree on the truth. So we work together. Number three, evangelistic. Now, this is an all-out evangelistic effort. Um, Dr. Reynolds, you and I talked several times before you came and preached that meeting. I talked with Pastor Sexton many times. I talked with Pastor Sexton like this. I said, you know, this time it's kind of different. I said, it's kind of like I'm the pastor and you're the evangelist this time. I said, it's different. 
I said, I want you to understand this is an all-out evangelistic effort. I said, some of our pastors are even confused. Some of them are saying, uh, we've got to do this. Got to, I said, we've got to all realize the whole purpose of this is evangelism. It's evangelism. We're trying to preach the death, burial, and resurrection of, of Jesus Christ. We're preaching that all men are sinners and that all need to come to repentance. And that's the truth. And um, these men did a great job. In fact, the message that Dr. Reynolds preached on Thursday night, one of the greatest evangelistic messages I've ever heard in my entire life. It was tremendous. It's an evangelistic effort. Then impact. I'll tell you this. I can testify to this. The impact in my area in Hampton has been large. The impact in West Virginia has been large. It's had a lasting impact on our area. It's had a lasting impact upon our churches. Now, we were doing all sorts of media interviews. We were on the front page of the newspaper more than once. Uh, the world was intrigued by it. <coughs> the fact of the matter is, 9-11... The 9-11 that we did in 9-11 service, the God Bless America Rally in West Virginia, the largest 9-11 gatherings that day were in New York City and Philadelphia. At New York City and Philadelphia, they didn't preach one word. They didn't pray one word. They didn't pray in Jesus' name, but they didn't pray anything. They didn't even have a moment of silence at those things. The third largest gathering in America as a service on 9-11 was in Charleston, West Virginia. And I'll tell you something, we didn't even have a rehearsal that we didn't have preaching and prayer at it. Amen. And that night, talking about impact, all four of the local TV stations, as we went on the air, when, when Jimmy Mitchell was giving his testimony, we were live on four TV stations. And I mean, he's just given the gospel. You heard two minutes of his eight minutes testimony that night. He, I mean, he's pointing folks to Jesus. We could have given an invitation after his eight minute testimony. It's had impact. We were on talk radio stations, all these things. One newspaper lady came and interviewed me and said, Brother Fox, what are you hoping to, will happen out of these things? I said, a great awakening. She said, huh? I explained to her about 1734 how we would had a great awakening when, when Jonathan Edwards fasted and prayed and pointed everybody to God. And sinners started getting converted and people started making covenants with God. Priorities changed in America. And we turned back to God. At the end of the interview, she said, I want to give to this thing. It was amazing how God financed all this. Absolutely amazing how God financed it. One man, one man that I've only met one time in my life, he called me on the phone and said, Brother Fox, I'm going to help you. I know he's a Navy man. I thought, wow, great. I mean, I've only met him. I shook hands with him one time. He, he was a first-time visitor one night at, a, at an independent Baptist I preached, meeting that I preached. He was a visitor, first-time visitor one night. And he called me on my cell phone and said, I want to help you. I said, great. I was trembling a little bit because of the, the, the finances. And I'd already committed to the guys. I said, if you can't raise it, I'll do it myself. I'll pay for it. You can say things that you regret, you know. And uh, I was standing at Whataburger. <laughs> Look at me. I eat, man. I was standing at Whataburger. That man called me. I hung up. I said, Lord, I pray he'll send $500. I said, a big gift. Two days later, I got a call from one of my secretaries. She said, hey, Brother Fox, we got a check in for $10,000. I said, you read that wrong. I said, that's $1,000. She said, oh, no, I've read it over several times. It's one o comma o o o point o o. I said, "Woo, glory. God took care of all that. I only had two times that I trembled a little bit. And listen, never doubt God. Just follow him. It has had tremendous impact. Well, let's just look at a couple other things, and I want Dr. Reynolds to just, and, and listen, somebody, somebody else has done a, a couple of crusades or trying to do some crusades, and somebody came to me and said, well, Brother Fox, somebody's stealing your idea. I said, it's not my idea. I said, there have been lots of folks who've done this before. I said, anything we can do to help them, I'm helping a group out in Oregon have one of these things. Praise God. This needs to happen everywhere. Now, I, I want to talk about the next four guidelines, and we'll get Dr. Reynolds up here. Important guidelines. Are you, are you with me on page two? Important guidelines. Now, here's four guidelines that I just live and die by on these crusades. Number one, our laborers. They all have to come out of our, our churches. The choir members, the ushers, the greeters, the decision counselors, the parking lot attendants, the children's service workers, the offering counters. Everybody has to be a member of one of our sponsoring churches. I live and die on that. We're not going to have 
the, the Methodists, they're welcome to come. The Episcopalians are welcome to come. Folks who are atheists are welcome to come. Everybody's welcome to come. But the workers are all our workers, and they have a little form they have to fill out, and their pastor has to check off in agreement. They have to be approved by their pastor. Because, you know, the pastor's going to know the people better than I will, and somebody, he's not too sure that they've got the people skills to be a greeter. You know, they just always kind of look this way. That's not the best greeter, you know. Walmart wouldn't give a guy like that a greeter job, you know. And so he's going to direct them to the right jobs, you know. And so the workers, the labor force, <coughs> are all members of our churches. Now, our scripture, now we're only going to use a King James Version Bible. That's settled. And I'm not going to debate that forever. That's just settled. It's settled. I'm not going to debate all the nuances. That's what, it, that's what it's going to be. Number three, our music. All the music in the crusade will be traditional evangelistic music. And most of it comes from our music company, Bible Truth Music. Uh, we did This Is My America with the choir. We used our hymnal, uh, Bible Truth Hymns. Um, our children sang, uh, and the big children's choir sang Bible songs for kids. They sang scripture songs and other children's songs that we've done. All the music was not, well, let's put it this way. We're not going to have any suspect music. It, it, is it going to be highbrow? No. Is it going to be rap? No way. It's going to be evangelistic and thrilling and hearty. I've never heard such singing in my life as some of the singing that went on in these crusades. You'd get up there to lead the singing, you'd say, number 32. Everybody sure said, hey, they don't even know what number 32 is. But they knew if it was in that book, they liked it. It was amazing. Nothing, hey, nothing exposes indifference in our churches like half-hearted singing. Man, the singing was hearty. Well, so we've, we're settled on the Bible, we're settled on the music, we're settled on the workers, and one more thing, our patriotism. The meetings will be patriotic, but not political. No politician will speak. Who's going to be doing the speaking? Preachers are going to be doing the speaking. Yeah. I cannot tell you how many politicians <laughs> wanted to make a little speech or accept a little award. Because you start getting having gatherings like this, a few thousand, they think, Votes, man. <laughs> I mean, we had senators who were in office call and say, hey, would you mind if we, I've got an award to accept. Mind if I just accept it right there at your gathering? We'd already made the policy. No, sir. We don't want to be rude to you, sir. But the steering committee, these pastors have made a policy that no politician is going to speak. He said, well, one of the politicians said, well, I won't speak. I'll just receive the award publicly. I said, sir, <laughs> you will have to speak. You'll have to say the words, thank you. And we're just not, I said, if you will come, here's what we'll do. This is what we do. And we did this. If President Obama came, we'd, we'd have him stand and we'd pray for him. We're going to pray for them. Now, now, I was out in Ravenswood, West Virginia. You know where that is, uh, Dr. Reynolds. I was in Ravenswood. We're begging people to come to these things. She said, I am not coming to that thing where you're just going to bash the president. I said, ma'am, we're not going to bash the president. We're going to pray for the president. She said, you bunch of conservatives, blah, 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 blah. By the way, her grandchild got in the children's choir, and she came. There are byproducts of having children's choir. <laughs> but we're not there bashing people. We're praying for people. We want to see everybody in this world saved. They're, the best kind of politicians are saved politicians. Uh, amen to that. Well, Dr. Reynolds, you were, <coughs> if you wouldn't mind coming up, you were there. February 1, 2, and 3, and you, you preached February the 2nd, and you spoke to the crowd on January 31st uh, at that prayer meeting that we had. It was amazing, just amazing. We had prayed for good weather. We had good weather that week. We could have had, it was 31 degrees in Hampton, Virginia, January 31st. We could have had a tent meeting, you know, but we had a building. Why don't you use this microphone and just give us a, a word of what you saw and testify. You want a word from uh, Hampton? Yes. From Hampton. I'd like to say, first of all, I thank God that somebody has done more than pray for this. You know, I think we all pray about it. I pray about it. But, uh, and it had to be somebody that, if I can say it this way, is not tied to a local church. It had to be somebody like an evangelist that had a, a touch with a number of people. Uh, and 
you know, God gave Byron the burden for that. And it is a, like the Lord to give someone the burden for it who has uh, the position and has the ability to do something like that. Uh, of course, are you going to give questions and answers? Well, sure, yeah. yeah, because somebody's got to ask the question, how much money are you talking about? It's big business. One night rally, one night rally in Charleston, West Virginia. Over a hundred thousand dollars. Over a hundred thousand dollars. When you do that size, you don't bring the sound equipment in on a van. It comes in on eight foot bricks. The bigger the building, the bigger the budget. <laughs> and of course, whenever you have that building, you've got to hire the security, and you've got to hire the parking lot workers, and basically all those things and and that's that's the way everybody does it i mean that's just the way it is and uh but you divide that first of all you divide it by 45 oh, yeah. you divide it by 45 then you divide it by the number of people in those churches and you get it down to where it's manageable that's right. it's manageable and then you get somebody just walks up to you and sends you a ten thousand dollar check yeah. <laughs> and that helps. Uh, and that's what God does whenever we obey him in doing what he gives us to do. Uh, in Hampton, Virginia, I don't know, and I haven't said this to you, but I don't know that I've ever spent as much time, not in preparation, but in prayer yes. to preach yes. as I did up there. Because I felt incumbent upon me the pressure of the investment of those people and their time what they had done and the preparations that had gone into now i must tell you also something that i'm amazed at as a testimony from that meeting for a person to invest his time his money his effort his credibility all those things, and not preach in the meeting is unheard of. And here, this guy says, this is my burden, and this is what I feel God wants done. And, you know, the one thing I told him, I said, I think you ought to preach. I think you ought to preach. Uh, but in that meeting, he said, I believe this is, what, this is what needs to be done. I have never felt so much pressure preaching anywhere as I did there. And uh, first of all, to do a good job, and then to have the power of the Holy Spirit and to have God work. I, I don't know that I've ever felt that uh, before or ever feel that again. But it was an absolute fantastic meeting. I think sometimes we think, well, if People get together like that, you know, that they all just get together and maybe my people run off to somebody else's church and they'll, they'll meet a pastor that gets to pray that night and he'll feel a little more, you know, and they'll say, oh, I'd like to go over and hear him and see what that church is like and everything. No, no, the next Sunday after it was over, you know where they all went? They all went right back to their same churches. And they all gave right into that same ministry where they had been before. But what happened in this was things were given to people, and he talked about people being involved that hadn't been involved and done anything for years. Right. But you put in their hands a tool that they can do. If they can give out flyers and speak to people, there's a place for that. But if the only thing they can do is walk up to a door and put a door hanger on the knob of a door, yes. they can do that and be a very intricate part of it. And it's interesting, once they find their entry level of what they can do, they will begin moving up. And they did that. Yes. And, and then the flexibility of the people. Because, I mean, we prepared for one thing, and then it just worked another way, even in the invitation time. Yes. And what it was the counselors who were prepared to deal 
and take people into a room just adapted to saying right here, let's just deal right here. Let's take care of folks right here and get folks saved right here. Amen. They just adapted. That's right. But that's the Holy Spirit working in that. Oh, yes. And it was... Uh, it's a wonderful thing whenever you do everything and you make all those things that the way the Lord leads you, being in the way the Lord leads you, but you're moving in that way and the Lord leads you. And then instantaneously the Lord can just move a different way and he has the flexibility with people who are surrendered to him. And that happened there. And, you know, I've tried to stay up with some of what has going on, going on there in the Hampton area, Virginia Beach area, uh, since that time. And it's just been a wonderful thing in the, in the churches and in the atmosphere in the churches and uh, the burden in the churches. I had not heard this about this 24 folks coming forward in one service. Oh, yeah. But that's fantastic. It's one thing for us to wring our hands and grieve and weep and pray. But it's another thing to just absolutely get under the burden and get out there and do something, and uh, right. and it can and again and I'm all for the, and I'm all for you know grieving and repentance and prayer and all those kinds of things, but uh, at some point, if we're going to uh, see it happen, we're going we're going to have to do it. I mean, uh, you know, and I think that's the way God intends it to be. I don't think there's any doubt about that. But I thank you, Byron, and I thank you for what you're doing. Thank Thanks you for God. what you're doing. I thank appreciate you. it. Yeah, it's one thing to identify the problem, something else to try to do something about it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Reynolds. Well, you want to know a, a couple of key things if you feel, is God leading you to do something like this? You're, does this intrigue you to be part of something like this? Or maybe you even lead the effort or whatever? You want to know two key ingredients? A big choir and a neutral location. The neutral location. The biggest uh, church in our area, as far as church building, we could have seated about 1,200, which, of course, would not have been large enough. If we'd have had it there, instead of having 40 churches involved, we'd have had four churches involved. You know, because everybody else said, God bless you, hope you all have a good meeting. But when we had the neutral location, everybody got involved with that. That takes, that takes some of the distraction out of it. And so find a neutral location, and then start having these choir rehearsals. Now, you're, you're training everybody. But somehow that choir, somehow getting little pieces of every church be in that choir, bringing their whole choirs together. So I ran the rehearsals, talking about preaching and so forth. I was the one, I was preaching in the rehearsals. We was praying in the rehearsals. We was working hard in the rehearsals. And then after we had, we had 13 rehearsals, and everybody had to come to at least three rehearsals. They had their own book. They had their own CD. I wrote them every Thursday an email saying, hey, you reply to me if you've listened to your rehearsal CD. You know, you have to inspect what you expect. But we stayed on it. But here, I'll tell you what happened. When the preacher would get up and say, now we're going to do this God Bless America rally. The choir had already been in all these rehearsals. They started getting the vision. And they were back there saying, amen, preacher. There's a, there's a nucleus inside that church. Besides the preacher had gotten a vision for it, the choir had gotten a vision for it. So if you want to do this, I'd, I'd suggest you, you put that choir together and start working on that early. And... and um, and then we had a day of prayer and fasting, January the 20th. I've never done this in my life. It was last minute. <coughs> never done this in my life. But in December, I felt that I was supposed to call on these four pastors to consider having a day of prayer and fasting. You know, the, the Continental Congress, they called for it here in America. They knew we needed God's help. Abraham Lincoln, we were in terrible times in the Civil War. He called on a day of prayer and fasting. England, the Spanish Armada was coming to get England. You heard of the Spanish Armada, man, all those ships are coming. You know what England did? They prayed and fasted. You know what God did? He sent a great big wind and destroyed that Spanish Armada. Remember Haman in the Bible, he said, I'm going to kill all of God's people. Well, you know what God's people did? They prayed and fasted for three days. January 20th, I was amazed at how many people prayed and fasted. You know, I'll tell you something. You can pray without fasting, but you can't fast without praying. You can go on a diet you can't fast without praying. There's all kinds of ways to fast. Is fasting about food? No. Fasting is about putting God first. And from January the 20th on, we just saw revival. We saw God. God built our faith. 
We had a protester. Remember that first night we had a protester get up on the platform. He's screaming. He's cursing. He's got earrings. People thought, people thought it was a skit. You should have seen the man's earrings. It's not a skit. What a first night. And some of the pastors told me I shouldn't have hired a policeman. I said, police. Those are pl guys up there on the platform. One protester. Isn't that brave? Got all these hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people there. And one guy going to protest all of us. <laughs> he was brave. Next night he was back. He decided to march around the building seven times. Where did he get that? Would you stand with me? We're going to close in prayer. If I can help you with any of this stuff, as far as organizing and so forth, I would ask you here in my last few seconds, would you pray about God's leading as far as Charlotte, North Carolina? I've challenged these pastors. We had 30 men gather last month, and we've been praying now for four weeks already. Brother Tim Cruz and others down that way, Ken Walters, Charlie Scott. Dr. Bobby Roberts has already said, I'm, I'm in. I'm going to help. When he gets in, that gets other people to get in. But I challenge these men, if we do it in Charlotte, North Carolina, we ought to have a thousand-voice choir. You want to get a region's attention? Put a thousand independent Baptists up there singing with all their heart before God. I believe that will get a few folks' attention. So you pray with us for God to lead us. Let's close in prayer, may we? Thank you, Lord, for letting us have this time. I pray you'd lead us. Dear God, show us your will, and may we quickly and instantly obey your Holy Spirit. May we confess all our sins. May we get rid of any doubtful things in our lives. And may we instantly obey you. Thank you, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thank you.